our first presenter is James Bateman, who's the CEO of MedChart. He's an avid hiker who's planning a trip to climb a mountain in Argentina. I meant to ask you how to pronounce the mountain. Aconcagua. I looked it up, it looks awesome. Really high, 6,000 meters. Yeah. And tonight, we're not gonna be talking about mountain climbing. <laughs> but you will be talking about the future of healthcare. So welcome, James. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Maggie, for uh, having us back again. Um, we're a big supporter of HealthTO, and thanks, everybody, for coming out and supporting as well. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about not missing the future of healthcare because there's a lot of changes that are up and coming, especially in the province of Ontario. And I thought this is a really relevant topic, especially for a lot of people in this room who are, who are in the startup community who are trying to figure out how do I sell into hospitals? How do I sell into clinics? And what do these changes mean for me? So first thing I'm going to do is, before jumping into that, is giving a quick update on MedChart itself. So if you don't know us, MedChart is a health data marketplace that's built on patient consent. So anytime you have a data need or a data demand that requires a patient consent to get access to that health data, we can go to our data suppliers and then provide that access to data for whatever purpose that you might need. So we were at HealthTO in 2017, was the last time that we uh, presented here and have done some TechTO as well since then and done all of our major announcements uh, really for this audience and this crowd, um, including our seed fundraise with uh, Golden Ventures. And now we've grown from the last time we presented about six people now to over 20 with two locations, and I wanted to share with the audience today a, a partnership with Dynacare Insurance Solutions, where MedChart is now going to be used to provide data to the insurance industry across Canada, uh, already live today and, and rolling out towards the end of the year. So basically every single major insurance company in Canada is going to be using our platform to, to get access to data whenever you apply for a health insurance um, application and give your consent to share your data as part of that application to expedite it or to get a, a better rate. So, oh, thanks. And I've got some of the team here too. You can find us uh, after the, the talk. And it, they, they look like a fun bunch. It's a, it's a pretty fun group to work with. Um, so the major change that's, that's going to be happening in Ontario are the Ontario health teams. And this is going to be affecting all of us. It's a model which is taking the current state of an individual going and getting access to the fragmented services um, that might be available to them across the healthcare system to one where now the province wants to assemble these Ontario health teams where you would belong to a certain team and have an integrated uh, care delivery model and be able to get all the service you need from one individual team. And the reason this is going to affect us as, as entrepreneurs is because it's going to change the funding model, it's going to change the governance model, it's going to change the way that they're making purchasing decisions to adopt the type of solutions that we're all building in this room. And hopefully move towards a model more of healthcare versus sick care. And those, what are the points that are going to affect us across those three different models? So as these, these teams are developed, um, there, right now, there's about 150 applications into the ministry to create these teams. Only five are going to be selected, and these teams are going to go live as early as fall this year. And we're going to start to really see the real impact of these different or of these organizations being formed. And but there's still a lot of unknowns, and I think we have an opportunity now to to voice our opinion and try to influence how they're being shaped so that way it works in our favor as innovators and get things adopted. And one of the things, that, some of the considerations I think are important are around the governance model. So if we take a look at accountable care org organizations in the US, which largely look like these Ontario health teams, would they, the studies have shown that the, the organizations that are actually led by the primary care physicians are much more successful than the ones that are led by the hospitals or the acute care facilities. So 
that sort of model is something that we're going to be have to be aware of because of, are the hospitals making the decision for the whole team or are the providers who's leading it or is it more of um, you know, a decision making body amongst the team the other one is the funding model is it fee for service are they just doing treatment getting paid or and I, and this is what I think the direction is is going from uh, how the literature that's out there more towards a global model where that uh, health team is going to be funded based on the, per, the population health performance of all of the participants in the team. And now how does your innovation improve their metrics in order to uh, make them eligible for more funding and you're aligned with the financial incentives of those teams to make them do better because if you can make them do better and get more funding then your solution is more likely to get adopted. But then what does making it do better mean? And that's where we can talk about value-based procurement versus the traditional model today of traditional procurement, which a lot of us in the room have experienced and have hit a lot of roadblocks on. Value-based procurement is a new model for procurement where they actually make decisions based on the benefits and the merits of the solution that's coming in, and they weigh that in a way that is above just what is the lowest cost uh, solution that checks all of my requirement boxes. And this is a model that I think the Ontario health teams will be able to actually start to enact and we'll see realized. Um, and the value factors, so I borrowed this from our, our friends at Techna and UHN who wrote the KHO guidelines on, uh, on BPS, uh, the guidelines on BPS, uh, sorry, on innovative procurement and to provide just a simple guide to the BPS guidelines. And these are the value factors that value-based procurement is based on. If you can move the needle on any of these, now your solution is going to rank higher than others. And it gives us more clarity and guidance on how to build our solution and how to position it for the healthcare system versus just trying to meet the minimum requirements of an RFP um, while giving the cheapest bid. Um, and, but when you, whenever you introduce these value measures, you need to be careful that what is being reported in order to um, provide the, 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 to quantify what is better than another is actually the impact or the outcome that is being had. So that way you're not optimizing for good, for reporting and to try to game the system to get the best result according to the measure and you're actually doing, uh, you're producing an outcome that is affecting the real healthcare system. And adopting technologies that are out there, we all have technologies that will actually make real improvements, but right now the, the measures and the, the quality measures aren't necessarily aligned. And this is an opportunity for us to also go and um, advocate for those reporting measures to, for example, be standardized. So one for us is the turnaround time that a facility can deliver health records, let's say, to a patient or to an insurance company or to a personal injury lawyer. A lot of those turnaround times that are reported today are misreported because of the reporting standards. If you go to a facility, their stats might show they're in great shape, but if you actually do a, some analysis, you'll, you'll show that they're, they're at, you know, multiples out of whack with what they're actually doing in terms of the, the overall turnaround times. So finally, I just wanted to finish on for those innovators that are trying to get their innovation adopted. You may not have an opportunity to uh, do a, a full proper procurement yet, but there's something called innovation procurement where these institutions have an opportunity to evaluate the value of your solution and adopt it at their own discretion, as long as it's something unique that someone else can't easily add or modify their systems to create. And there's a few hospitals in Ontario, South Lake Hospital was one where we started at about three years ago, that do innovation procurement, and it's a great starting place to seek out these facilities in order to get yourself on the ground, get your first hospital sold and get your solution some traction so that way you can continue to continue to build it going forward so thank you so much appreciate your time and i hope that uh you guys got something to take out of it
Any questions? Would you happen to know in the new model what will happen to the family health teams? Um, I, I can only speculate. Um, I'm not writing the policy. There, are, there is some great documentation um, available on what the OHTs uh, envision to try to achieve. But the family health teams, I mean, in my opinion, from the, the, the people that I've talked to, I think they have an opportunity to really be the nucleus of the OHT. Um, I mean, they're, they're essential to, the, to any OHT to provide an integrated care because the primary care provider is really, you know, the, the quarterback for all of your health care. Um, so I, I think that they're going to be a central part. I don't know exactly what they would be, but I think that, uh, you know, if you're part of a family health team, uh, you, like, it's, it's a good time to make sure that you put your foot forward and say, you, we need to, we, you need to notice us and you need to put us at the center because of the, the key role that we play in healthcare. Hi, uh, I wonder if you know that how this pilot is with, uh, you know, right now the Ontario Health is running with the hospital be a lead and create, a, you know, what is called uh, the value-based pilot that they're running with different hospitals which they should partner with the community clinics and serve their community. How is that going to affect who are going to be the first round pilots? How? Startups can jump in probably in the second round because the first round usually are the big names. And what are your suggestions? Do you know how then the outcome will be evaluated for adopting those technologies which have been shown effective in the these pilots? All right. So are you you're talking about the the first five Ontario health teams that are going to be awarded yeah. by the fall? Yeah. Yeah. So those teams. Um, so this is just our our company's stance on it is that if you're not directly part of that integrated care delivery model where you're providing that care and you're let's say a technology partner or a startup um, we're looking at it as more you know how do we want to influence the different policies and the rules that are going to shape these teams and then once they're developed and are established with all the different healthcare providers and players who are members of the teams, then going to those teams and, and looking to participate with them. Um, because, I mean, as a technology partner, there might be opportunities to get in at the application phase, but also that's riskier because with 150 applications in and only five being awarded, um, you know, it's, you, I feel like it's better to wait to see who the five are that come out and then everyone's going to be looking to partner with them and trying to get them to fund their solution or uh, adopt their solution. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's how we're thinking about it um, at MedChart. Uh, 